Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're going to get started in just one minute here. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, once again, and thank you for joining us. My name is Lauren Groh, and I am the Director of Major Gifts at the Westchester University Foundation, and I'm a proud Westchester alum. It's certainly beginning to look a lot like Christmas, and I can think of no better way to commence the holiday season than with an evening dedicated to the story we've all loved since our childhood, Twas the Night Before Christmas, written by Clement Clark Moore. Tonight, we look forward to a lecture with Pamela McCall, an authority on this popular poem. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Ron McCall, Westchester University Special oh. Collections Librarian and Curator of the William Darlington Herbarium. Thank you, Lauren. Welcome, everyone, and happy St. Nicholas's Day. Did you know that? I just found that out myself. Um, I just want to start by saying that this evening wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for Barbara Perone, a devoted book collector, former teacher and librarian, and a 1956 graduate of Westchester State Teachers College. One of Barbara's collecting passions has been the beloved Clement Seymour classic, Twas the Night Before Christmas. After more than 50 years of collecting, Barbara has built one of the premier collections of the poem anywhere in the United States. Our collection's more than 600 volumes cover everything from books to advertisements to Christmas ornaments bearing the poem. Thank you, Barbara, for your dedication to collecting and your loyalty to Westchester. Your collection will always be one of our greatest treasures. A couple of years ago, the collection attracted the attention of another devotee of Moore's poem. Pamela McCall created a global media sensation when she published the first smoke-free edition of the poem in 2012. Since then, Twas the Night Before Christmas, edited by Santa Claus for the benefit of children in the 21st century, has won multiple awards and remained on bestseller lists every holiday season. In recent years, Pamela has become one of the poem's greatest authorities, regularly speaking about the life of its author and its publication history. Now, to celebrate its 200th birthday, Pamela has published a beautifully illustrated and thoroughly researched new book on the history of the poem entitled Twas the Night the art and history of the classic Christmas poem. Tonight, she will regale us with stories of this Christmas favorite. Thank you, Pamela, for joining us. It's all yours. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for um, inviting me. And uh, you and I both share the same last name, but I don't believe, I don't believe we know of our relation. <laughs> uh, I'm here in Concord, Massachusetts. I just spent the day here. It's a wonderful place to be. And uh, I'm finishing up a 21 day tour of five states. And I've been in museums and bookstores and galleries and I've done lots of media and it's just been really great. Uh, this Christmas Eve is the 200th bicentennial of the reading and the writing of the poem. It was read in New York uh, by Clement Seymour to his children on Christmas Eve of 1822. And I think that's something to celebrate. I certainly think there'll be a lot in 2023 because that's the bicentennial of the publishing of the poem in the Troy Sentinel newspaper 
of December the 23rd, 1823. So it's kind of a full year for me of uh, working on this book and on this uh, promotion and, and celebration. And I plan to be back out on tour in the fall. So I wanted to start my presentation with the cover of my book, which you see in front of you. I spent a lot of time trying to decide what to put on the cover because the poem has been illustrated thousands of times. There's a couple of thousands editions in print now. You know, and on top of that, there's all the newspapers and magazines and details and everything else that it's found its way onto. But there's so much um, art to choose from. And so the image you're seeing is by a woman named Helen Chamberlain. And she was an artist who I could find very little on about her life. And I dug and dug and dug. And I finally found an article that had been written by a journalist who had been walking down the street in New York and had discovered some boxes out with the garbage and they looked like artist files or interesting things of postcards and visuals and magazines. And he thought, oh, he didn't know what they were, but he thought I'm gonna take those home and I'm gonna see what they are. And so he realized it was her, her art files that she's thrown away and he pieced together her life and wrote an article about it. So I was able to read it and you know, learn that she was a single woman who looked after her elderly mother and she'd exhibited a few times. So I thought she was such an anonymous person in a way that she would be fun to put on the cover of my book. So this is an image by um, Helen Chamberlain and I obtained this image from the William and Mary University at the Swim Library where the other great collector, Nancy Marshall's um, collection is housed. So these two great collections, the one you have and the one that Nancy Marshall donated, her collection is around a thousand pieces. Um, Nancy Marshall died um, and bequeathed it to the university. And I do not know if they're building that collection, but um, in my travels in the last you know, six months, I've certainly come across lots of people with additions and I've stumbled across a woman in Ohio who has, I think, 300 plus copies, including some from 1840 onward, and she's looking to house them somewhere. So there's real opportunity, I think, during the centennial and the, or the bicentennial year to reach out if you are building your collection to some of these people when this poem has um, the spotlight shone on it to possibly build your collections even further. I was in a city in New York, uh, Richfield, and I met with a Boston antique dealer, again, who had a large collection, including an FOC Darley, which is very rare, from 1862. So they're certainly out there. And uh, I think that it would be fun to work with you if I can to help you build it. So um, we'll move on to the next slide. I um, started my work with Clement Seymour because he is considered to be the poem, the poet of the poem. Um, Benjamin Morris, Benjamin Franklin said that under modest dividends that one should always, you know, Air on the side of caution, um, you're, if you're not certain on something, and the authorship of the poem is questioned by some people. Um, and so with the you know, consideration of Benjamin Franklin's thought that maybe we should not become emphatic. Um, so I'd like to preface that when I say Clement Seymour wrote the poem, there is some doubt that he did, but I think the evidence points towards him. Um, the man claimed it in 1837, it was written in 1822, so 15 years later. He defended his authorship in the newspaper when somebody else credited it to another author. He said no to the editor in a letter to the editor. I wrote it, it's mine. Um, and he wrote it out four times in his lifetime and signed it. He also included it in his book of poetry in 1844. And I think the more you get to know the nature of the man, um, it's hard to um, accept that he went along with a bit of a, a, bit of a scam. Um, he's a very pious man, very, um, very well educated. Um, he's a he graduated from Columbia, and uh, he gave the valid Victorian uh, speech called "Gratitude," which we can't find. But he lived a really honorable life um, and a very scholarly life, and a very he was a very generous man um, throughout his life. And I just have a hard time putting the pieces together that he didn't do it. Um, in one of the po the editions that he hand writes, he does add a footnote to it saying. I, it was written a long time ago, and I don't remember when, which is kind of unfortunate because so it sort of <laughs> leads people to speculate that maybe it was Henry Livingston Jr. or Julian Verplank or somebody else. There's no evidence of that. There's just family stories and, and rumors. So I think it is Moore's, and, uh, but I'm always open to you know, new pieces of research coming to light that would, that would question that. 
The Moors lived in Manhattan. Uh, they owned all the land of Chelsea. This is their home. Uh, it was inherited by, ben, by um, Clement C. Moore from his mother, Charity Moore, and who was married to the Bishop Benjamin Moore, who was the Bishop of the Diocese of New York. And they were a very wealthy family. They owned lots of land. They developed Newton apples. They had all kinds of interests um, and uh, very, very interesting family. And some of them go back to the Mayflower and early Americans. So, you know, it, it was a really fun project to delve into the Moors. There's never been a, a thorough biography I written. Hey, Starman's on it, Roger. And uh, this home was eventually torn down and thrown into the river, the Hudson River. So we don't have this as a museum, which is very unfortunate. Um, Moore, after he leaves this home, he goes to live in a townhouse and then he goes and lives in Newport where he'd summered and he ends up uh, dying in Newport, Rhode Island um, wow. in the, July of 1863. Um, so it's very unfortunate we don't have more on the Moors. Uh, some of the archives are at Columbia, the letters of Charity Moore, his mother and his diaries of the last five years of his life. He did not write a diary um, earlier, which is again, very unfortunate. Um, so the poem itself, um, it appears, as I said, in the Troy Sentinel on December the 23rd of 1823, placed there by Orville Hawley, the editor. He was a graduate of Harvard, very, very interesting man. He ends up writing a biography of Benjamin Franklin and all kinds of other things. But what he does is he puts a preface before the poem that is a glowing testament to the poem. It's just a wonderful piece of writing. And it follows the poem along when it's reprinted in other newspapers and almanacs shortly after it first appeared, it became a success immediately. It was reprinted in, in, in other papers and it grew and, it, and its popularity just, it, once it was printed, it was you know, on its way to being you know, shared across America. This illustration is by Myron King and it's from 1830. So this is not the original Troy. This is, a, this is later, this is 1830. This um, woodcut, we do not have the original, but it's the first time that the poem was illustrated. Um, it's kind of an interesting image. Um, Myron King had come to Troy and he was an engraver in the city at the time. So as I mentioned, this wonderful poem um, was printed in the Sentinel and Troy, Troy, New York takes great pride in the fact that it was printed in the Troy Sentinel. They're planning a big celebration for 2023. Um, they'll be doing exhibits and all kinds of things. They'll probably do their mock trial of the authorship question again and uh, just bring attention to the poem, which is terrific. The poem, as I mentioned, was published in lots of papers. And because it had appeared in the Troy Sentinel as an anonymous piece, editors from the very beginning took liberty with it. And you see things like the punctuation changes, the words change, the title changes, and in 1828, the lines, happy Christmas at the end changed to Merry Christmas. So people took a lot of liberty with the poem. Um, and so, you know, as we go forward, you know, there's all kinds of versions. You have mice versions and pirate versions, and there's the night after Christmas, you know, there's all kinds of things that come about. Um, I really enjoyed collecting all the newspapers of the period uh, for not only looking for editions of the poem that were printed, but you get so much more when you go and find the original, the, you know, the, the newspapers of the times, because you get images um, and you just find all kinds of interesting sort of classified ads and, and just, it just puts it in context of the era we're talking about. Moving into 1841, it appears um, in the New York Mirror. And this is the first time we have an illustration of Santa Claus going down a chimney. This is considered the earliest image of, of this occurrence. And it's interesting because they've changed it from Christmas Eve to New Year's because in the 1800, early 1800s, New Year's was the big day of celebration and children were given trinkets and there were Santa Claus cookies and all of these different sorts of traditions. There's a lot of um, rowdy behavior as well, a lot of drinking, a lot of festivities and uh, gunshots and you know fireworks, all these things were happening. So this is interesting that they've still haven't switched over to Christmas Eve as standardized. It's still, Sometimes Christmas Eve, sometimes New Year's Eve. This engraving also appears the following year in 1842, and it's used to sell Christmas goods for Pierce Department or Pierce Store in Albany. So it's the first time that we have a commercialization of Santa Claus, and it's dated 1842. <laughs> so 
it's just interesting how quickly they picked up on the popularity of this character and his ability to sell goods. <laughs> so that actually, I should go back. This is in dis on display right now in the Albany Institute in New York. They pulled it out for me and the original is on display in their lobby. Um, and ABC News is doing a little documentary on this, I believe. So as we go forward, the poem is, as you know, in your collection, it's published in these beautiful editions with lots of people coming to it to illustrate it. This is just a lovely edition, um, vintage edition, um, as is this, when they used, you know, all kinds of you know different elements in their illustrations. And I just think this, these are both very, very charming. Sometimes you see 10 reindeer. I think here we have eight, but sometimes you see 10, which is sort of <laughs> interesting. So in the poem, there are eight reindeer. So when I was working on my book, I thought I was working on Clement C. Moore and sort of 1822 and you know going forward because the man's life, you know, one bookend is the American Revolution, the end of it, and the other one is the end of the American Civil War. So I thought that was the period. And then I quickly realized that the legend really is St. Nicholas of the third crossing over in the fourth century. And it's from this image, I think, that we can explain this the best, because here we have St. Nicholas on the left, and he is throwing gold into the windows at night to save these two young girls who are daughters of this man to, from being sold into slavery or uh, prostitution because he doesn't have a dowry. And so here you have anonymous giving at night um, by St. Nicholas. And the father decides to stay up one night to see who's throwing the gold in. And he, even though St. Nicholas says, please, I want this to come from God. I don't want this to be identified with me. The father does tell everyone and the legend of St. Nicholas is born. And it's, there are several great legends of St. Nicholas, of course, but this is one of the most famous. And it goes right to the heart of our story and where the idea comes from. Um, and I think it's wonderful to think that we throw, you know, here you have gold coins being thrown through the window, but we put oranges to represent gold balls and gold coins in our stockings, which take us back to the threads of the Roman empire. I think that's really fun. If you're interested in cultural development, I think that's really interesting. It's a great thread. And I think the candy cane is the same example, you know, from a bishops, uh, from the staff going forward. So I like to say that this poem was centuries in the making. Yes, Clement Seymour you know, probably wrote it in 1822, but it has a very long and old history and legacy that was drawn, you know, through the ages. And I mean, the line from Hamlet is not a mouse stirring, you know, it's Hamlet, but he sort of shows up in twas. So these people, you know, like Clement Seymour were extremely well educated, read the classics and, you know, spoke multiple languages and played multiple instruments. And I mean, really, really um, very, very educated people. Clement Seymour actually um, brought Italian opera to New York. He introduced it to New York. So, and then of course, um, when I finished my sort of traveling through the Roman empire, <laughs> through Western culture into England, and the UK and then through the courts of Queen um, Elizabeth I and James, I traveled across the waters. And, uh, you know, not long after, of course, 1809, we have Washington Irving bringing his huge influence into American writing. And Washington Irving in 1809 writes about Christmas. And he writes about St. Nicholas flying over the skies of New York in a wagon. And he does it 25 times in Knickerbocker. So he was very influenced by the imagery and the idea that St. Nicholas could possibly be the patron saint of, of, of America by um, other Knickerbockers who wanted to promote that concept. He launches Knickerbocker at the St. Nicholas dinner. Um, so he chose it. He was very you know, conscious of this whole idea of creating some sort of inventing customs for America. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed Washington Irving. When I was working on my book, I didn't just uh, read these authors' works. I actually read a lot about their lives and to see their relationships and friendships and influence. Part of it because I was literary sleuthing for Moore and Livingston, but also because I really wanted to get to know them a bit. And so when I came to Washington Irving, you know, I spent a lot of time with him and I read a lot about his friendship with Charles Dickens and Sir Walter Scott and how the three of them, you know, when Washington Irving goes to Aberdeen to, to Abbotsford to visit, um, Abbotsford to visit Sir Walter Scott, 
he's heavily influenced by him. And he's told by Sir Walter Scott to read German, learn German and read their folk tales. And I think he's also inspired by the Scottish superstitions and the, the ghosts and the spirits and all these things. And out of that trip to Abbotsford, he actually writes, Nick, uh, he writes Rip Van Winkle and Stevie Hollow. But he also writes a lot about Christmas. And when you turn then to Dickens and you read Christmas Carol, you see the influence of Washington Irving. And uh, Dickens, I think, said that he carried Knickerbocker around in his pocket so much he had to keep buying new copies and that he mused with Washington Irving more than anyone else on the planet. Um, so, he, you know, he's a really, really, really influential character. And, and, and Washington Irving, some people say, um, invented Santa Claus. I don't think we need to do that. But, you know, I, I, he certainly had a huge role. Um, and... Uh, and there's someone whose home you can visit, this wonderful museum in Sunnyside, and get a real sense of, of uh, his life. His last book he ever wrote was a five volume set on the life of George Washington, which is stunningly beautiful to read. And if you really wanna understand this man, um, I think in part his obituary in the New York Times by William Cullen Bryant is a wonderful thing to read. You really get a sense of the man, so. Uh, Fenmore Cooper, uh, another great American writer, is also really important to the story because in The Pioneers, which he finished in 1822, which is before A Visit from St. Nicholas or Twas the Night Before Christmas, he mentions Santa Claus. And in the sleigh ride home, the judge is coming home for Christmas, he says to Aggie, don't forget Santa Claus is coming tonight. It could be the first literary reference of Santa Claus, which I think the man should have some credit for. So I put this here. Um, and I just, his daughter too, uh, Susan, who writes Rural Hours in 1851. I think that's really important to read too, because she talks about her childhood and, and, and Christmas and Santa Claus. So they were early into this. So he would have been in the same circle, you know, same sort of group as, as Clement Seymour and Julian Verplank. And I think that they all knew what each other was writing for sure. So interesting. So here we come to FOC Darley. Um, this is the edition I just found in, in, in Richfield, New York. And this is the edition that Teddy Roosevelt read when he was four years of age. That puts it in perspective. Um, FOC Darley, Darley was the most talented and famous illustrator. He's considered to be by some the father of American illustration. And he, I, it was incredibly talented. I love his work. And I think this is the one, if it's a quintessential twas, this might be it. Um, it's wonderful little edition. Um, not very many editions, not, not very many illustrations and they're all hand colored because it's, it's 1862, but um, very, very charming um, edition. He did, he illustrated um, Fenmore Cooper's work. He did Washington Irving's, he did Dickens, he did Poe. He did a, a lot of people's work. Um, so very, very famous. And he's not that hard to collect today. His originals are not that expensive. I was quite a surprise. He, he doesn't have the following. I think he deserves. This is um, Prang. Prang comes to America um, with, from Germany with printing presses, and he makes a big splash. He does a lot of uh, Christmas cards. He is very interested in Twas. He does an illustrated version of it. But I think what's really interesting about Louis Prang was that he democratized art in America because he printed posters or reproductions that people could hang in their homes. And that changed interior design and was very influential. And so I put him on the back cover of my book because I think that he deserves credit um, for his accomplishments. And he had a real eye for uh, good art and he put out competitions to get people for his work um, that were really popular. So. I think he's a really interesting man and, and a talented man. Of course, coming through the illustrations, you come to Jesse Wilcox Smith, 1912. Um, Jesse Wilcox Smith was a student of Howard Ply at the Drexel. And what is so interesting about Jesse Wilcox Smith to me is that women had been involved in illustrating fashion plates by hand coloring them for a long time. And being in the arts was an acceptable career path for a woman then. And when Howard Ply starts the Drexel, he specifies that half the class has to be women. And so he's really tutoring and, and, and mentoring and encouraging women. And out of his school comes Jesse Wilcox Smith and Gertrude Kay, N.C. Wyeth, Joseph Leyendecker, all these wonderful people. But it's these, the, Gertrude Kay who does um, Alice in Wonderland and, and 
Jesse Wilcox Smith, who does so much. Um, she cover, I think she does covers for Good Housekeeping magazine for decades without stop, like every single issue. She's incredibly popular and does extremely well. Um, her edition of Twas, again, could be considered a quintessential Twas with Darley. Um, you know, just spectacularly popular. And uh, they're around $350 for an original, the, the edition. It's not that that much, but um, they're not that they're not that hard to find. Um, and there's lots and lots of printings of this. I saw one to, yesterday, someone had one, it was a 12th printing on, in, in 1912. So there's lots of them around. Um, but she's certainly an important artist, as you all probably recognize her work, and, and she's in, collected in major museums across America. I come to this slide now because in working on a book like this, you, you know, all the fun sort of finds and, and the great people you meet and the great sort of literature you get to read and the art you get to see, you also have the opportunity to correct some things. And one of the things I like to mention is that I corrected, this is Percival, um, and he was a poet, American poet, and he, there was a poem that was printed in the Torres Sentinel that was credited, it said that it was anonymous and that it, no one had copyright on it and all of this. It was Percival's and they just put the wrong name on it. But the really interesting piece I wanted to mention tonight is not necessarily Percival and correcting that small, small editorial issue is the fact of, the fact of slavery and the fact that there's rumors out there and people will say that Clement Seymour owned slaves. He did not. Um, I spent a lot of time on it and I spent, um, a lot of time pulling slave records and everything else. I also found a journalist in New York who spent three months working on it. And it was last Christmas Eve that we kind of finally put it to bed. And uh, there is no evidence that he owned slaves. That's a miss, that's just incorrect. His father did, the Bishop, um, Benjamin Moore did, and he financed slave ships and did these things like so many people did, but Clement Seymour did not. And so when you're working on someone's life and you read, you know, biographies that aren't factually correct and they talk about slaves and all these things it's nice to be able to correct it and in my book I go into it in um, a few pages but I do correct that I think it was important especially in this day and age this is Mary O'Dell and, and this is another great find um, in researching the book because the oldest handwritten copy of this poem is on paper that is watermarked 1824 and we believe it's in the handwriting of Mary O'Dell, this woman, the silhouette, and it's in the Fredericton Museum up in Canada. How did it get there? We don't know exactly, but Mary O'Dell is the daughter of Jonathan O'Dell. And Jonathan O'Dell was a, an American, he was a poet, he was a surgeon, but he was also during the American Revolution loyal to the crown. And he was a great friend of Bishop Benjamin Moore, Clement Seymour's father. And Clement Seymour was, their own, was Charity and Benjamin Moore's only son. And so they made Jonathan O'Dell his godfather. But during the American Revolution, what's really interesting is that Jonathan O'Dell was also a spy. And he decoded all the um, correspondence between Andre and Bernadette Arnold and was central to the whole affair. And after the American Revolution, he goes to England and he's given a commission in Canada. And when I was doing the work on Jonathan O'Dell, I found in the Library of Congress a letter by George Washington that gave Jonathan O'Dell free passage. <laughs> they didn't know he was a spy. <laughs> and so he's walking around doing all his work with free passage. No one bothered him. Um, and then Fred Moore Cooper writes The Spy, which you may have read The Spies. And it's a novel, a fictional story about espionage and people with false papers and false, you know, um, disguises and everything else and letters from George Washington. So I thought it was kind of fun that here's a real life case of exactly what Fenmore Cooper wrote about. So kind of fun to make those connections when you're doing research. The other big thing was finding Constable Hall. This is Constable Hall in Constableville, New York. And this family of the constables, which are um, descendants of William Constable, who was the aide um, de camp to Lafayette, uh, came from Dublin and was very involved in land development in the North Country and opening up China, the trade to China. This is his son's home with um, with his wife, who's a Moor. She's a she's she's related to the Moors. It's Clement Moore's cousin, and uh, her mother is Benjamin Moore's first cousin. So 
this family has this story that it was in 1822 in the summer when there was a raging epidemic um, in New York that the Clement Seymour family traveled up here with their children to get away from the disease. And it was here he was inspired to write this poem. There's not much to go on. There's a chess set that may have belonged to Moore. They think it, they think it does. Um, there's no copy of the poem. They say they might've had one at some time. There's no journals, there's no letters, but I've been here several times. And the reason I think this is a really interesting piece of this is that it's 1819, it's Regency, it's not Victorian, it's the right era, right? It's perfect. If Clemency Moore was standing there in that room, right? It's not that hard to believe it. And, and it's just a magical place and it's a beautiful museum. And uh, it's been a museum since eight to 1949. And so I've been building a little collection of twice for them just sort of to make the poem come alive. And uh, it's, it's just charming. And I, I just think it's really, really an interesting place to go and get a sense of the period. And I don't think there's that many places you can do it that Moore actually may have been in. So um, I support, you know, there's their sort of fanciful thinking. Coming back to illustrations is Thomas Nast. You really can't talk about this without Thomas Nast. He comes back to America from Europe um, covering war in 1863. And the Civil War is still going on, but he turns his hand to Santa Claus pretty quickly and gets dives right into it. He does lots and lots of images of Santa Claus. He takes quite a bit of liberty with it. We have a long pipe now. Santa Claus in the poem has a short stump of a pipe. And he, he, not, he does not invent the North Pole concept, but he builds on other people's ideas of the North Pole and, and takes it. Um, he also introduces Naughty and Nice back into the concept of Santa Claus, which is not in Twas Night Before Christmas. And I think it's really important that it's not because I can't imagine the poem being as popular as today had it a birch and rod and threats of children being beat up if they weren't well behaved. Um, so I think that's a really big part of Twas's charm. But so Thomas Nass, you know, very prolific um, with Harper's and very, very popular. He was also really popular with Theodore Roosevelt when he joined, when he um, moved into the White House with his young children. And, uh, and uh, I think Theodore Roosevelt supports him until he sends him off on a mission. He ends up dying out, in, I think, in the South America um, of a disease, which he catches on this commission. Really sad. But um, he has a major museum in New Jersey, and his work is very, very collectible, and there's lots and lots of it. Um, so by the end of the 19th century, you start to see a lot of bread. You also see a lot of developments in printing and publishing, and so it makes sense. You know, they're now printing in full color and. And here's a Santa Claus from a, from a vintage edition. Um, I have this one. I have about 150 right now. Um, so this just comes back to my book. Um, I know Ron mentioned in 2012 that I took on this poem. I just really wanted to, I was working on a, a campaign for tobacco prevention. I thought, what can I do? And, and I looked around, I thought, oh, it's Santa, he's smoking. That would be a good project. And it ended up being, um, um, off the charts is the only way to describe it because it hit the front page of the National Post in page two, and then it went literally, you know, viral. It, it, it Stephen Colbert did a spoof on it. Barbara Walters got involved. Um, NBC Nightly News, Associated Press, the BBC. You know, it just went absolutely crazy because people had this feeling and this thought that no one should mess around with this poem. No one should dare to touch it. Right. Even though it had been changed, you know, almost from the day it was first printed in 1823, people altered it to their own liking. They just didn't think it was a great idea. But then there were a lot of people who did think it was a great idea. So it, it was really interesting to see the backlash and, and, the, and, the, um, and the acceptance of it. And it's now 10 years since I did it. And I'm really happy. It still often shows up in the top 25 in American poetry on Amazon. It's, it's done really well. It's been in four languages and it was just a thrilling project to work on because I had read letters from children written to Santa Claus that said, the only thing we want this Christmas is for you to get our parents or, or a parent to stop smoking. And so my thinking was, okay, so this five-year-old has just written a letter to Santa 
And then they're sitting down to read this poem and they bump into Santa Claus smoking. And I thought, these children deserve to have a smoke-free Santa. And so I'm going to do this. And, uh, and I, I'm just really, you know, proud of the fact that I did do that, <laughs> even though I took some major, um, I still do. I, I, two nights ago, I was speaking somewhere and some, someone said something, it wasn't okay. It was like, okay. But I mean, one just has to look at the master settlement agreement in 1998 that said that it's illegal to use cartoon characters <laughs> to sell tobacco to, because of science It shows the uh, influence that a cartoon character can have on a child. Not that they're going to run out and smoke, but it sympathizes them towards these products. And we don't want to have that happening given the enormous toll on public health or, you know, health and our public health systems. So here we have, you know, this is from my book. And I just, again, you know, it's eight reindeer. Rudolph comes much later. Um, and I'm often asked by people, where's Rudolph, especially little kids, you know, but um, he's much, much later. And, you know, I think you can say that this poem really, without this poem, you know, I just can't imagine so much other, so many other, you know, great classics like The Grinch or Charlie Brown's Christmas. I mean, so much has come from this poem, but because there's so many other works now, it, it runs a risk of being sort of forgotten, I think, in a way, um, because there's just so many competing titles um, at Christmas. And you walk into a bookstore and there's like dozens and dozens of beautiful children's Christmas books, you know, but this, I think there's hope for this poem to really survive another 200 years because the person who been who has been buying my new art book is often a grandfather or a father who enjoyed it as a child and wants to read it to his children or his grandchildren and if those children can fall in love with it the way that we all have and they have um these men and and, and moms who've been buying it um then it will survive because it's such a piece of people's christmas you know christmas eve and and sitting around and reading it and so many, many families, they actually pass it, you know, each member of the family reads a few lines and they pass it around. I heard that time and time again, um, which is wonderful. I think it's also really important to mention that it's completely uh, appropriate and allowed to read this in the school system. There's been this conversation that possibly because it's a Christian, it's Christian based or it's Christmas, but the Supreme Court actually ruled that to say such a thing and to deny it is, a, is an overreach. And I think one has to remember it's an elf. Yes, it's St. Nicholas, um, St. Nick. Yes, it's towards the night before Christmas, but it's an elf. And, and, and so the Supreme Court, it's a, I have it in my book because it was just so, I loved reading it. Um, and I thought it was really the, the correct <laughs> answer to that. There was, I think, a couple of teachers, a couple of schools put out a memo saying, you know, nobody put a Santa Claus on any of your windows. And, and that's where it all sort of came from when it, it went to the Supreme Court and they ruled that that was um, an overreach. That's, it's been part of our culture for centuries in America, but also in centuries in Western culture. And it's, um, it's okay. So. Um, that would be um, primarily what I want to talk about. I want to just talk a little bit more about collecting because that's of interest to you. Um, I have a small collection of a, about 150 works and it's considered this poem to be the most famous as in the most memorized and recited work in all of English literature by many people. It's also considered to be the most reprinted work in the library of English literature and the most collected. And so because there are thousands of editions out there now um, and, you know, so popular, it, there's a copy in most, you know, not most, but many homes in America and new editions coming out every year, that collecting is a real pastime of not only the institutions, um, but also of, you know, private individuals. And I was in Saratoga Springs the other day doing a book signing and I got there a little bit early and I was standing on the sidewalk and I had my book and, and the woman came up to me and said, oh, I just saw that at the library. And then I turned around and a man came out of a little house. It was on the sidewalk. He was setting up a little Santa house to have children come and have their picture taken. And I introduced myself and he said, uh, oh, well, I'm the Santa. I'm not an outfit, but I'm the Santa. I'm the, I'm the one who takes, you know, puts the kids on my lap and I tell them, you know, the whole thing. And I told them what I was doing. And they said, oh, just wait a minute. And he went to this little house 
and he brought out a box of vintage twas. <laughs> I just went, it's everywhere. Like, wow, so many people collect this poem. Um, and, you know, we collect them because they're either charming, you know, we love the illustrations, or we're trying to find an edition that we enjoyed in our childhood. Um, I have one from 1958, um, that I, or not, no, it's earlier than, a little bit earlier than that, 1956, 57. But, you know, it, it's what you, you knew as a child that you try and replace, you know, and I think that's sort of interesting. And then you also, as an art um, enthusiast, you go and look for these great illustrations of Jesse Wilcox Smith and FOC Darley and W.W. Denslow. I mean, Denslow's edition is, I'm sure you have it. It's, a, it's an incredibly interesting um, edition. Denslow is the one who illustrated The Wizard of Oz and he comes to Twas and he just, it's so fanciful and fun. And it's just, it's a wonderful, wonderful edition. Um, and so you pick people that you like. Um, when I was working on this, I certainly, you know, looked at Norman Rockwell, but he did not illustrate the poem, but he certainly did a lot of Saturday Evening Post um, images that come from the poem. And the same with N.C. Wyeth um, and Lion Decker, these great artists, they didn't, and Andy Warhol, they didn't necessarily illustrate the poem, but they were, certainly were inspired by it. And uh, in Norman Rockwell's case, you actually have an edition, a painting called Twas the Night Before Christmas. It recently sold for, I think, half a million. Um, it's in a private collection. But you know, there's favorite artists you can go and pursue, but there's four editions of the poem handwritten by Moore, three are in museums, one's in a private collection. The one in the private collection was put up for sale in a Neiman Marcus catalog a couple of Christmases ago, and uh, it, asking price was $750,000. The other huge collector was um, Jock Elliott, the huge um, advertising, um, you know, uh, agency in New York that he worked for Ogilvy. He collected for years, decades, and he had a massive collection um, of Dickens and of Twas. He had things, um, you know, that just only institutions had. There's no, nobody, you know, just really, really rare stuff. He had a lot, he was a very wealthy individual and could do that. But unfortunately he died in 2006. And by Christmas of 2006, everything went to auction at Sotheby's and just scattered. And that was, I think, really unfortunate. Um, because so much of this work people would like to see and and you know now it's just gone and scattered everywhere so really really unfortunate um but i think uh collecting you know it's just it has it's either a passion and a pastime or it's you know it's a, a financial business too you know because these things trade all the time one of the people that I've been looking at recently is Ellen Clapsaddle. I don't know if you have any or not, Ron, but Ellen Clapsaddle was um, a very uh, prominent uh, Christmas card uh, artist at the end of the, of the 19th century. And she has a very, very tragic story because she was very successful in America and she invested her money from her, from her, from her artwork into a printing company in New York. And then when she got even bigger, Somebody had the wise idea of going to Germany and buying up printing presses. And uh, we all know what happened, uh, First World War. And uh, everything ends up being blown up. And she has a nervous breakdown and is found wandering the streets of Berlin and it comes back to America and dies. Uh, very sad. Um, but her work is very collectible. I was on eBay the other night after I'd seen a major collection of it. And I, I was on eBay looking for it. And it's everywhere. Um, she was so prolific. I think, it, I think she did 3,000 images that were printed into postcards. And so, but some of her really good ones, um, I think are certainly worth collecting. And, and there is huge interest in her. And some people say that she uh, created the Santa Claus that we know as jolly with the, the rosy cheeks and kind of merrier than other images we've seen in vintage collections or editions. It's kind of an interesting, I haven't really studied that well enough to really make that conclusion, but interesting. So, um, so, that's sort of what I wanted to have to say tonight. But if you'd like to ask me questions, I'm very happy to talk to you about them. <laughs> Anything you have to say? Yeah. Great. Thank you, Pamela. And yeah, let's take some questions. Um, if people have them, they can type them right in the chat and um, we'll read them out. Ron, did you see we had a chat question um, just to see if there were other images of the later editions? Let me see. 
Oh, do we have ready images of any of the later editions to show? Denslow, others. Um, tonight? T tonight? Yeah, tonight. We probably... <laughs> Short um, notice, but. Um... Well, I can hold up Denslow for you if you want to know who I'm talking ah. about. He's certainly in my book. Um, I did. I primarily it's sort of 18, 19, 23 and earlier because of copyright issues, but also because so many of these things are available online, like um, Haddon Sunbloom, who does all the Coca-Cola ads of, of St. Nicholas or, or Santa Claus. It's all copywritten. Coca-Cola said flat out, never. <laughs> we will never release copyright, right? So, but you can Google him and you can find all of his work online. So I didn't really need to reproduce it because you know, it's there. So this is a Denslow. That's Denslow. So you kind of recognize Wizard of Oz probably, right? That's Denslow. And Denslow made so much money off the Wizard of Oz that he ended up buying an island and changing his name to King Denslow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he was a pretty colorful character, huh? That's great. And um, yeah, and this is Lion Decker, if you don't know who I mean. Lion Decker um, is just before it, or not a contemporary, well, I guess a contemporary of Norman Rockwell. And um, Norman Rockwell loved his work. Um, very, very wonderful artist, right? Lion Decker. He was the epitome of the uh, Roaring Twenties Gatsby kind of character. He and his lover, um, you know, the Roaring Twenties, they, they, they've written a play about their life. He was the Arrow Man. So I'll let you know what I'm talking about. Um, his lover was the ins inspiration for the Arrow Man um, advertising campaigns. So. He's a fun, he's an interesting man. Any other questions? No? Don't be shy, folks. <laughs> There's a question. Uh, did Schooner do any illustrations? Do you know? Don't think so. Don't think so. No. NC Wyeth um, is one of my very favorites. And Andrew Wyeth, his son, um, he doesn't illustrate the poem, but he does a painting of an open window with striped stockings by the bedposts. So you think of Christina's world and everything, right, with Andrew Wyeth, but he actually did come to the poem as well. And we have one photograph of Clement C. Moore. It comes from Columbia Archives, and it's the only known photograph we have of Moore. And we have one of his home as well. And they were taken by Nathaniel Fish Moore, his cousin. So that's kind of fun. It was a really thrilling day for me when I actually opened up the file and went, okay, here's Clemency Moore. Here he is, right? And there he was playing chess with his daughter. So that's kind of, I was really happy to get that into my book. <laughs> I have a really, happy. I have a really silly question. Sure. Um, was it, was it um, purposeful that you removed the apostrophe in front of twas? It's the standardized way now. It's okay. It's otherwise people can never find it online. It's just you're you're really causing problems for yourself as a publisher. Interesting. And I call it twas. Um, yeah. I mean, twas. So it's a soleil just did twas the night they did they did it like this too. It's kind of the way. I was I, just so curious. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know when I'm 64. When I was growing up, it was apostrophe, but now it's not. I think mainly because we're online and you will not find it if you did that. <laughs> yeah, as easily. Yeah. Anything okay. else? Does anybody have an addition? Does anybody have an addition they read to their families? Yeah. Ron, do you have one? Do you do you uh, read it? I, I confess I have one and we don't read it. Maybe this, <laughs> maybe this year we'll make a tradition of it. <laughs> yes. Not yes, too, I do. Big, right? Yes, we have for years. I, I think it's in this room, but I'm not sure. Yeah, raise a glass of cranberry fizzle or something to moor on Christmas Eve and say thank you, you know. Yes. This poem has brought so much joy to people's lives. It's it's such a, it's a piece of hope, you know, and I think that's so important. It's, um, that's what it is. It's, it's faith, you know, and it's hope and it's happy and, and it's inclusive, you know, there's no judgment. It's just so endearing and children just love it. I was up at the Munson speaking the other day. And uh, I had all these two-year-olds. I thought, are they going to stay sitting here around this Christmas tree while I read this entire poem? And they did. Mm -hmm. They did. And they'd just been given jingle bells. And so they were all distracted. And they still listened. 
And I thought, this is great. This is great. There's something about this poem. They just love it. And they, and they remember it and they, you know, they can recite it, which is really great. Not the whole thing, of course, but at least get to the first couple lines, you know, so, you no, know, it's, um, I think, uh, I think it has a long way to go. You know, I really do. I think it'll be around. And, uh, you know, I don't think these other books will, you know, outshine it. I think it's, I think it's here to stay, <laughs> you know. You just have to look around and see all the inflatable reindeers and everything out there and realize the influence of this poem. And I was in um, Plymouth, Massachusetts when um, at Thanksgiving and I, and I had this opinion that, you know, it was turkey dishwasher and then let's put up the Christmas lights. It was, it was as though someone turned a switch on because when I was driving around afterwards, I was like, wow, we lost no time in November getting into Christmas. It's such a happy, wonderful time of the year that, you know, it brings out the best of us, you know, it does. And I think that this poem, we have a lot to thank the poem for doing that. So <laughs> generosity of spirit and looking out for people and hope and love and peace and kindness, you know, it's all there. So it's, it's great. It's great. I can't imagine us without Christmas lights and Christmas. <laughs> Well put, it's, well said. It's so um, dreary. <laughs> <laughs> one last one last question. Um, someone asked, do you know, has it ever been turned into a television show or a, a movie? I know we see it in commercials quite a bit. Yeah, sure, it has. It's been a multiple plays. It's a ballet. It's a it's a circus or soleil performance right now. It's a silent film. It's a Mickey Mouse film from the 30s. It's absolutely. Okay. And it's it's been read by like Louis Armstrong. And if you really want to get a chuckle, you need to go and watch Prince Charles, soon to be King Charles, doing it with Camilla and Maggie Smith and Judy Dench. And I think all of it, well, some of us have the opinion that Charles isn't that much fun. He cracks up. He's having the best time ever. <laughs> so, and I always think it's fun to think that you know, here you have the King of England reading the most famous poem in the world, which is an American poem. I think George Washington would be having a chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Well, thank you for having me. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, thank you again, Pamela. This, is, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended this evening. Um, if you enjoy events like this, please consider joining the Friends of the Library. Um, the Friends is a community of library supporters who contribute to our collection services and resources. And as a member, you can help plan events like tonight's talk and shape the future of the university libraries. Speaking of future events, please join us this coming April for our fortnight of festivities honoring the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's first folio, just one of the exciting things we have coming up. I think Lauren has a, another uh, event to, to promote. Yeah, thank you, Ron. And Pamela, thank you so much for coming this evening and uh, sharing your wealth of knowledge on TWAS. Um, this was also a great holiday experience. And I like to think I can speak on behalf of our group here tonight when I say thank you for your time and your expertise on this Christmas collection. As Ron mentioned, if you enjoyed tonight, I hope you join fellow alumni and Golden Ram families on Saturday, December 17th from 10 to 11.30 a.m. in the Phillips Autograph Library for special readings of The Night Before Christmas from the Perone Collection. There might even be a special guest appearance from the man in the big red suit. And don't forget to save the date for our Charter Day of Giving on Friday, March 10th, when you can support the Westchester University Libraries through Friends of the Library. And lastly, don't forget to join us on Saturday, March 25th at Longwood Gardens for the 40th anniversary of the Presidential Gala. We hope to see you there. And to close, I want to thank you all again for coming and to quote a classic, happy Christmas to all and to all a good night. Night, everyone. Night. Thank you. Thank you, Pam.